All right, guys, we're diving into chapter one in the Physics of Heaven book from Bethel Church, from School of Supernatural Ministry, written by Judy Franklin and Ellen Davis. I talked about the intro and just some of the beginnings last time, and now I'm jumping into chapter one. Wow. Okay, this book kind of goes right into it. I have some issues with chapter one. I have not read the rest of the book. I, I don't even know what's going to happen in chapter two or anything else. So I'm taking this one chapter at a time, and you're going to journey with me as I just read this book for the first time and, and take a look at some of the truth claims of it. So they start off with saying, have you ever read a passage in the Bible that you kept coming back to again and again, and you just feel drawn to it, you latch onto it? And I'm not sure which of the two authors. Oh, sorry, it's Judy. Judy Franklin is writing this part. She said that Romans 8, 18 through 22 was that for her. And here is the passage that we'll talk about. It says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of creation wakes eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption and the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And she asked this question, what exactly does Paul mean when he says all creation is held back, longing, waiting, groaning, and travailing until the children of God are revealed? So that's her legitimate question. What does he mean when he's when he's talking about this? That, that creation is groaning and waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. So then she kind of asks follow-up questions, which are very leading. She says, hadn't the children of God already been revealed by the time Paul wrote this letter to the Romans? And Jesus was crucified. He's resurrected. This is years after Pentecost. They're already Christians. And these were the men that, quote-unquote, turned the world upside down. According to the book of Acts, there was miracles and deliverance. So... She asked this question, what exactly was Paul talking about? What is the manifestation or the revealing of the children of God? That's a legitimate question, and it's a really good question. So let's look at the scripture that she's quoting in context. Reading any scripture, it's always important to look at the context. What was being said before? What was being said after? Ideally, especially when it comes to a letter, you're supposed to read the entire book before you're kind of picking out any section of it. Because in the same way you read an email, if somebody sends you a really long email, you don't just read the middle paragraph and take that. You'd read the entire email. And if it was like 12 pages long, you would just take take time to sit down and read all 12 pages. If you didn't have the time, you would wait. You probably wouldn't just read the first paragraph, leave it for a week, then come back, read the second paragraph. Nobody reads an email that way. And this is the ancient world of an email. It's a letter it's written to from an individual to either an individual or a group of people. So you need to read the context. It's very important. You've got to read the entire letter. We're not going to read the entire letter of Romans in order to figure out what the context is in this section, but we should at least read the paragraph before it and the paragraph after it. That's a basic, helpful study tool. Anytime somebody's quotes scripture, you always want to read the whole paragraph before, whole paragraph after, the paragraph that they're quoting, so that you're getting a good idea of the context. And sometimes you got to read more than that. The context really builds on itself. So what is the context around chapter 8? Chapter 8 and verse 12, Paul talks about being heirs with Christ. And he says that we got to live according to the flesh, you'll die, but we got to live according to the spirits and put to death things of the flesh because we, led by the spirit, are sons of God. And the same spirit that cried out, Abba, Father, bears witness with our spirits that we will that we are children of God, and if we're children, then we're heirs. Then he goes on in verse 18, where she's quoting. She says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Okay, so what is this revealing going to be? He answers this question. Creation is groaning out, and not just creation. It says in verse 23, where she ended the quote in verse 22. What does 23, verse 23 says? It says, and not only is creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of God, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as son, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, so he's saying not only is creation growing out, but we too are growing out. Why are we groaning? Because we are waiting 
for the adoption as sons and the redeeming of our bodies. Verse 24, for in this we hope, in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we will wait it with patience. And so this goes back to the Thessalonian church, where Paul's talking to the Thessalonians about what is raised, what is uh, put perishable will be raised imperishable. And he compares the body to the, the new body that we'll have that's like Christ. Right now we have this tainted, physical, sinful, broken, sick body. But when the new kingdom comes, when, when life is perfected and Jesus ends suffering and death and sin and, and, and all that's gone and taken away with, we'll be having a new body that is perfect, that there's no disease, there's no suffering. It's it's a body like Christ. And so Paul right here is making very clear that what is what are we waiting for? What are we what are we groaning for? We're waiting to be the full adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. So Paul answers the question that she was asking. What does he mean when he says this the subject of creation is groaning out to and, and waiting? So what is creation waiting for? It's waiting to be perfected. And when Christ returns and brings the kingdom of heaven to earth completely and fully, that the bride is kind of being taken down into earth, that this perfect Jerusalem will come to earth and earth will be redeemed because it was subjected to sin because of man. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, it literally changed the structure of the world. Thorns and thistles were produced. Nature itself changed. And I don't know if hurricanes and typhoons and all of these natural disasters, quote unquote, were part of God's original perfect plan of his of his planet. Or maybe it was a change as a result of the fall. So when the perfection comes, we're not going to have a broken, groaning creation. Paul's kind of personifying creation. But his main point is that we also are groaning and waiting for the redeeming of our bodies. So this is what she says. She felt like there was more to the verse and she began eagerly seeking the Lord as to what they meant. And she says this, he shared that from the day of Pentecost until now, no child of God has ever fully realized the power that has been put within us. God has given us power to raise the dead and heal the sick and cast out demons. And we've done that to a point. But although we are extremely happy and grateful for the power we are operating in, in no way has it reached the measure of what he intended for us. Jesus said that we would do greater works than he did, but no Christian in history has exceeded Jesus' work. Okay, so let me be very clear of what she's saying here. So number one, she's saying that the interpretation she is getting is from God. God told her the interpretation is that the meaning of this text, the groaning that it's referring to, is that we are waiting to re be revealed the power that we're supposed to have. That's what it was. And, for, and from the day of Pentecost until now, we haven't realized it yet. So we're supposed to do more miracles than Jesus. So already right here, just from a biblical standpoint, I have to part ways with this. Number one, I get very uncomfortable when somebody tells them God told them the interpretation of Scripture. So it's already leaving anyone out that has maybe another interpretation where, uh, you know, clearly I could say, well, God didn't tell me that, so is my interpretation true? But I would say that my interpretation is true because that's what the text seems to clearly imply. But somebody can say, well, God told me it means something else, and that's that's uh, shaky ground to be on, uh, to say the least. Now, maybe you can say that, and if you have the scriptural back backing to back up that claim, that would help. But I, I don't... I could just say, if you read the text in Romans chapter 8, to come to that conclusion would be very difficult. It doesn't seem to imply that at all, what she's saying it is interpreted as. That that we're supposed to do more miracles than Jesus, and that what it's saying is what we're waiting for the groaning is because we haven't received the power we're supposed to have. Another small thing I'll have to part ways with her on, which I understand many in the charismatic church take that verse of doing greater things than Jesus to mean that we will do, as an individual, do more th miracles than Jesus did. I don't interpret it that way. I interpret it as greater as in the church as a whole, that we have greater influence than Jesus had as one individual who came not for the purpose of 
in the time telling everybody or personally evangelizing, he gave that to the church to do. He came, he died on the cross, he, he proved he was God, he healed the sick, he, he made sure that people understood exactly who he was, what he was there to do, but he left it to the church to evangelize, to spread the gospel, to tell people the good news, and, and to pray for the sick and all of that stuff. And so at, for, the, for the thousands of years since Christ has died, I would say that the church has been able to accomplish greater things than Christ did. Now, I don't think, and, and she would agree with this, there is no Christian in history that has come anywhere close to personally doing the miracles that Jesus did. Not even close. Not even remotely close. And uh, Bethel would agree with that. I think they're kind of frustrated with that. They believe that we should be doing that. And so they're, they're trying to press into getting this kind of power or authority to be able to do what they feel like we're called to do. So I can understand the interpretation. I can understand where they're coming from. I don't personally hold to that. Like I said, because at the end of the day, Jesus is God. He is God. He was in the beginning. Everything was created from him, through him, for him. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, I don't like putting myself in comparison to God himself and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what he did. I'm actually going to do better, more things than what God could do. I just, I don't, I don't mind not ever getting close to that. I'm happy with whatever God uses me for, and I hope it's for his kingdom and his purposes. And I think everyone has that heart desire. We want to see people get healed. We want to see people get saved and set free and redeemed. I think I think people that have a passion to step out and do that are have noble intent. And I'm just disagreeing theologically with kind of the driving force behind it. I'm okay with Jesus being God and that I'm not going to get anywhere close. I'm not going to walk on water, most likely. I'm not going to turn water into wine. I, I'm not going to go into every town and heal every disease. Jesus would go into town and it says everybody got healed. I, I may not ever see loaves of bread feed thousands of people. I'm not concerned with what it is that God has me do. I'm just happy that God is using me in whatever capacity he wants to spread his kingdom and his, his message and his glory, whether that's with miracles or whether that's with his truth. I, I just want to be obedient to him. I'll leave that at that. Now, here's where she kind of puts even more emphasis into this. She said, the next thing that the Lord told me was that soon he would release a sound from heaven that will literally change how the structure of what we think. Okay. She says, this new sound will transform us like the transformation spoken of in Romans 12, where Paul talks about the renewing of our mind, and we won't be conformed to this world, but be conformed to the will of God, and bringing heaven to earth is our mandate. She continues with this sound, and here's where I get a bit uncomfortable. I don't know if she's intentionally meaning to do this, but this is, she starts comparing this sound to the Holy Spirit. So let me read it. She said, I began thinking about the day of Pentecost. 120 believers were in an upper room in Jerusalem when they heard a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It wasn't a wind. It was a sound. And when that sound ended, the thinking of those men and women was completely changed. Instead of hiding in the upper room, they spilled out onto the streets and boldly preached about Jesus. This whole idea about a transforming sound has been mulling around in my spirit for years, and I have been studying everything I could find about sound, vibration, and frequency. Okay, let me stop right there for a second. The sound of what? Of the Holy Spirit coming in, like a rushing wind and tongues of fire appearing upon their heads. But who empowered them? To make, to make this drastic change, it's the Holy Spirit. It's what Jesus said. I am sending you a helper, a Holy Spirit, and it's good that I'm going because he's going to be with you. He's going to teach you the things that I've spoken to you. He's going to empower you. Apostles filled with the Holy Spirit go out and do that. It had nothing to do with the sound of the Holy Spirit coming. So she seems to completely miss the, the Pentecost story. I know if I sat down and talked, okay, I don't know, but. I, I think if I would sit down and talk to her, 
and say, you know, it's the Holy Spirit. She would say, of course, yes, of course. And then I would say, okay, so what are you talking about with the sound? Why would you even say this and kind of make it sound like that it's the sound that caused these men to change? This had nothing to do with the sound. But I think she's trying to say in the same way we're going to hear another sound from God and it's going to change us. But again, the sound is irrelevant. It's the Holy Spirit. So it should be more the Holy Spirit's going to come in power over us again. And that should be the focus, not not a sound that is being made. I hope that makes sense, what I'm trying to communicate here. So again, she talks about we need to place our hearts in an upper room posture. She's mentioned that a few times. We have to have an upper room posture in order to receive this sound. She hasn't yet explained what that means or how to do that. Maybe she'll get into that a little bit later. I still don't know how you put yourself in an upper room posture. It could be Bethelingo that I'm just unfamiliar with, but maybe she'll explain it later. Then she says, so that I believe the sound is going to empower us to do greater works than he did. We go, ooh, see, I cringe at that. What do you mean the sound is going to empower us? I hope you mean the Holy Spirit. I don't know why you would call it the sound. I hope you would mean the Holy Spirit would empower us because that's biblical. <laughs> but a concept that sound is going to empower you to do greater works than Jesus did, I don't know how to say this nicely, but that it's borderline blasphemy. It's pretty borderline blasphemous to, to attribute the work and the power of the Holy Spirit to a, a sound, an undefined thing. We, we've gone from a tangible God, three persons and one God, and the Holy Spirit is a person that thinks and has, has thoughts, a will, gives direction, that gives giftings to different people. And, and we've kind of, I don't know, for whatever reason, turned it into a sound that is going to accomplish that. That is a bit concerning. I don't know how much he wants to run with that, but that's just my thought. It seemed a little bit concerning. Then, in the next part, she says that as I studied more, I became convinced that God is preparing to reveal his kingdom insights about sound. And if we will receive and embrace these insights and revelations, we will finally become the children of God that creation has been eagerly awaiting. Okay, so now she's circling back to Romans 8 and saying that it's all about this sound thing. If we basically take the teachings of this book, that I guess she's going to dive into even more, if we receive and embrace the insights and revelation of this sound teaching, quote-unquote sound, <laughs> not sound doctrine, but this sound teaching, then we will finally become the children that creation has been eagerly awaiting. But as I've already said, creation isn't waiting for us to have a sound. Creation is waiting to be redeemed from the the fall of man, the sin of the world. And not until Christ returns and we have our redeemed bodies, that's what that verse is talking about. So again, this is this is not what it's talking about. That Romans 8, in, in no way would you ever read Romans chapter 8 and come to the conclusion, oh, you know what this means? This This longing and this waiting that creation is waiting for, it must be a sound that we're going to hear that will release power. The sound is going to give people power to become the children that creation has always been longing for. You, this, this is not anywhere in scripture at all. So this is this teaching is coming from her quote-unquote revelation and her visions. She's applying those to the text, which is not there. So just keeping them as separate things. God can speak to you, and that can be true, but Scripture is also true. We need to look at what Scripture is saying. So in, in this point, I can clearly say that that is not an interpretation, and it doesn't bother me if somebody says, God told me this. I think it's a very weak interpretation, and I have no problem saying, I don't think that's true. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about with this sound, but I know that that's not what that verse means. At least you can't apply it to that Scripture. She then talks about that as she was looking at sound and discovering more of it, she read a book by Ted Decker that mentioned quantum physics principles and the names of some leading quantum physicists. I don't know, Ted Decker, I just looked him up. Apparently he's a mystery thriller fantasy novel author. Again, at the beginning of the book, she said most of the people that she quotes aren't certified or professionals in these areas. But I think more she saw he maybe listed some names 
about quantum physics, and so she researched these men on the internet and ran across this article by an astrophysicist named Bernard Haish about the zero-point field. Again, I don't know anything about the zero-point field or this guy. And she said, I've been learning about the zero-point field and wanted to study more about light, sound, energy, and vibrations. And then she's going to quote from his book. And there's a long sections of quotes from his book that I'm not going to go into. And to be honest, even when I read it, it's a little bit jargony for me to go. I don't even know what he's talking about. When I looked him up, he seems like he, he went to a Roman Catholic school and he is an astrophysicist. And in some ways, he's trying to pair some of that God-believing faith with science and quantum physics. And he's kind of pairing some things together. Just a few things like he he's a full-on believer in evolution and he tries to kind of put those things together. How does evolution work? How does creation work? He doesn't – so he's kind of like trying to figure out generally how God might have put the universe together. So I don't, I don't know the guy well. I'm not sure if he's a Christian or not. This is an article that she was really fascinated by. It says Bernard Hayes' article called Brilliant Disguise – about light, matter, and zero-point field. This is what the... Maybe I should read this section, just because this was so profound for her. This is what Bernard writes. It is certainly a beautiful poetic statement, but does it contain any science? A few years ago, I would have dismissed that possibility. As an astrophysicist, I knew all too well the blatant contradictions between the sequence of events in Genesis and the physics of the universe. Even after substituting eons for days, the order of events was obviously wrong. It made no sense to have light come first, and then to claim that the sun, the moon, and the stars, the obvious sources of light in the night and the sky of the ancient world, were created only subsequently. But it be days or eons later. One could say, of course, generalize light to mean simply energy, and thus claim a reference to the Big Bang. But that would, to me, be a more of a stretch than a revelation. So that's what Bernard's saying. If you... I'll try to paraphrase it. He's basically saying, oh, yeah, it's it's kind of hard to pair his Christianity with science because he thought science is clear that this couldn't be right. Genesis couldn't be right. The order of creation is in the wrong order. That can't be true. The, just saying that each day is in millions of years, that doesn't make sense. That's how he kind of ends it. He's like, that's a bit of a stretch of a revelation. And this is what her response is to this guy kind of – in my opinion, just like not seeing, not taking the literal scripture literally. She says, as soon as I read that paragraph, I looked up and I saw God the Father at the beginning of time and our universe with nothing in it. Okay, so she said, I read this paragraph and I had this vision. And then got, it, it, it was completely empty, formless and void. Then the Father said, let there be light. And out of his being came wave after wave of, and wave of what appeared to be light. The light waves were curved, not straight, and as I watched the light, I instantly thought, just like an artist prepares his canvas before it paints on it, God prepared our universe so he could create us and space that that universe needed. It's like, oh, okay. So she's saying, I, ha I, I read this, and I had a vision of God creating the universe. Then she said, I immediately found a dictionary and looked up the definition of light. Two of the definitions were energy and power. I looked up the definition of energy, power, and light. And then the definition of power was energy and light. And the meanings of these three words, light, energy, and power, are so interchangeable that they are used to define each other. I, I looked up the meanings of each of these words, and I actually never found any of these other words in the definitions. So I'm not saying she's lying, but maybe I'm not sure what definition she – or what dictionary she used. Maybe there's another dictionary that says it. I just Googled it, and if you just Google light, it never mentions the word energy or power. And when I did the same thing for the other ones and never mentioned light, it's one of those things that you can sometimes use those words to describe each other, but they are not the same words. Light, energy, and power are different and depends on the context or how you're using it, so they're not always interchangeable. It doesn't work like that. It's just That's just how language works. But she was kind of convinced that she says, this meant that in my vision – the waves of life flowing from God's being could just as easily be called waves of energy or, or power because both are essentially the same things as waves of light. In essence, I saw waves of all three, light, energy, and power. 
And, what? Okay. There's a lot of like building on false assumptions. So you have to assume that her definition is correct, which in my case, when I looked it up, it's not correct. Again, I don't know what definition that she is using. But the assumption is that she land on, landed on was light, energy, and power are the same thing. They basically are all the same thing. And they mean the same thing, and they can be used interchangeably. So when I had this vision, after I read this guy kind of not being able to put Scripture and the Bible together, had this vision, and, and explains it. So it is power and energy. Okay, well, again, I'd say, well, you have to go back into Genesis. And when God says, let there be light, what's the Hebrew definition for light? Does it mean power? Does it mean energy? And I would go from there. I didn't do that right now, but that, that would be step one. I felt uncomfortable at the beginning when she said, everything in this book is absolutely true. That's the claim. I mean, you shouldn't make a statement like that if you really believe it's true, but that means that this vision is absolutely true, and I don't really have space to question it. I don't think that that – I don't think – she would say that because, like I said, they were kind of this back and forth thing. Oh, if this makes you uncomfortable, don't worry about it. That makes me uncomfortable. Would never feel comfortable saying, you know what? That's it. That's how it was done. When God created the heavens and the earth, when he said, let there be light, this it, there, it, it came out of him in curved, not straight, as she says. It's curved, not straight, and it's power. It's energy. It's not, it's not light. You go, okay. I'm not going to take that as an absolute personally. I'm not I'm not going to write that in the scripture and feel like that's how it goes. Moving on from that, she then quotes Bernard's article even more. He talks about this thing called a zero point field. And it is confusing as crap. I have no idea what this guy is talking about. Let me just read you, <laughs> read you a little blip of it. Uh, he says, the fact that the zero point field is the lowest energy state makes it unobservable. We see things by the way of contrast. The eye works by letting light fall on the otherwise dark retina. But if the eye were filled with light, there would be no darkness to afford a contrast. The zero point field is such a blinding light since it is everywhere, inside and outside of us, permeating every atom in our bodies. Bodies, We are effectively blind to us. It blinds us to its presence. The word of light that we do see is all the rest of light that is over and above the zero point field. So his claim is, again, he's trying to put Christianity and science together somehow. So he's saying like, oh, when God says, let there be light, there's this, there's this deep light out there that's above and beyond everything that we can ever see. And so if we're right that this says, let there be light, it's a profound statement the solid, stable world of matter appeals to sustain at every instance by an underlying sea of quantum light and reference of frame of light. There is no space and time. It's a little jargony. You know, this is quantum physics is a science that's a little bit out there and still still new. A lot of peer reviews, a lot of discussions. And this is an individual's attempt to take evolution, to take what he sees in scripture and pair them together what, with what he knows, with different theories he's coming up with. I don't know what the heck he's talking about. I don't know what he's talking about with the zero-point field and blinding light and this and this quantum sea of light that could exist out there, but we just can't see it because it's it's like a black hole or it's it's so bright that it's just un, unnoticeable because there's no darkness. Well, here's her response to this. But in my mind is, I don't know what he's talking about. She said, I was stuck. We live in a God-created universe sustained by a, quote, underlying sea of quantum light of immeasurable energy. One square yard of zero-point field contains enough energy to boil all water in the world. I believe that. And then here's her claim. She says, I believe that energy, that power, that light released by God at the beginning of time is what is in us and around us right now. That's God's power. Okay, pause. This is, again, pretty blasphemous. I don't know what she means by when she says God's power, because the Holy Spirit is the one that empowers us. And as I'm going to talk about a little bit longer, she basically takes the Holy Spirit away and inserts this quantum light, whatever that might be. And she's saying that I believe that this quantum light, this light that God spoke in the beginning, let there be light, there's this power 
powerful energy force that's released by God at the beginning of the time, and that's what's in us, and that's what gives us power. She says, the Bible tells us if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain be removed, then it will be removed. And then she says, I question if we really have the power to move mountains. She said, God first spoke into creation of the earth because he wanted Adam and Eve to be powerful. I don't know where it says that in the Bible, that he wanted Adam and Eve to be powerful. We don't have any evidence that they could move mountains with their words. Maybe they could, maybe they didn't. I have zero clue. Then his original intent was for them to multiply and expand the Garden of Eden to the point of the entire world to be like Eden. And we'd live happily together and God would be with us in this garden. I agree with that. The good news is that Jesus reconciled us back to God, but we should have been in the Garden of Eden. Okay, listen to this. But our minds haven't been transformed enough yet to realize it. I began to understand that if this world is actually going to be what it was created to be from the beginning, now that Jesus has redeemed everything, we need to know what the power, what this power is, this sea of quantum life that undergirds everything. And more importantly, we need to know how to access it. Whoa, what are you going on about? That is none of that is biblical whatsoever. It, it has, we have literally thrown out the Holy Spirit completely. We haven't been transformed enough yet to realize it. It's like, no, we <laughs> being transformed, this, the process of sanctification and being more, made more into the image of God with the help of the Holy Spirit. Sin exists. Death exists. We're still waiting for God to bring the second coming. With, that's when everything will be perfect. But she's under this idea that, no, our minds haven't been transformed enough yet because we don't realize the sea of quantum light that is in everything. And we need to access it to get the power. She says this, we have the zero point field within us. Individually, each of us may not have a square yard of zero point field energy in us, but two or three of us together do. And the Bible says that whatever two or three agree on, it will be done. So we truly have the power within us and around us to move many mountains. Again, where's the Holy Spirit? What? The reason that two or three gathered in Jesus' name has authority to do something is because of quantum light. Oh, I thought it was because of Jesus. I thought I thought that there was power in Christ's name. I thought that there was power in the Holy Spirit. I thought that when we gathered together as believers and as a church and we prayed into things that God would hear our prayers and move. But apparently it is none of that. It's the quantum realm of this sea of light, the sea of quantum light that we just need to access because each of us has this quote-unquote zero point field within us, but it's not big enough by ourselves. We got to get with two other people, two or three other people with this zero point light or what is it called? <laughs> zero point field. Then that will work. Well, here, I've just got a question right here. Wouldn't that mean everybody has this and then anybody has the power? Like it's then it's no longer a Christian thing at all. At, According to what this guy was saying is that the zero point field is blinding and it's everywhere. This quoting him again, he says it's everywhere. It's inside and outside of us, permeating every atom in our bodies. And we are effectively blind to it. So in his opinion, this light is everywhere. It's, it, it's all encompassing. This light that can't be seen. She's kind of saying, I don't know, you, that you have a part of it. And we got to get together in order for it to be usable. Well, then why can anybody do this? She goes on to say, Jesus calmed the storm. And we should be able to do that too. Jesus healed the sick. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. And we have that same power within us. And we also have the power around us undergirding our universe. I, what? I, that's blasphemy. That's, that is, that is saying... <laughs> That is ignoring the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm, I'd love to sit down and talk with her what she means by this because I guarantee Bethel Church doesn't throw out the Holy Spirit. I, I could guarantee that. I don't know them even that well, but I could guarantee that they wouldn't throw away the power of the Holy Spirit. They absolutely believe in this. So what is this going on about? We have the same power within us, and she says that power is undergirding our universe. She's claiming, unless what she's saying is that the Holy Spirit is the quantum sea of light, whatever the heck that is or means, 
but again, that's kind of weird. It's 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 like putting into flesh, and not flesh. It's like it's defining the Holy Spirit that Scripture doesn't define him as. It's putting him in this very weird box because an astrophysicist had this theory about these zones, zero point zones, and now all of a sudden that's what the Holy Spirit is. It's this zero point zone when God said, let there be light. And, you know, light could be interchanged with energy and power, which it can't. But let's assume that it did. That is the Holy Spirit. That That's just weird. Uh, that, that would be the <laughs> most lightest way, at least if you want to keep including the Holy Spirit, that she would have to mean. She goes on to say, doing the works, quote unquote, of Jesus, and even greater works should be an everyday occurrence for us. When a child gets cancer, we should be able to tell that cancer to leave now. Because that child is not meant to die early, he is meant to have a long life. Okay, I'm going to have to part ways with her on that. Who told you that? Who told you that a child is not meant to die early and he is meant to have a long life? Have you not read all of scripture of human suffering? And if you go back and listen to my, my podcast on suffering, Christians and suffering, I think this is a key distinction of, of having a bad theology around suffering. Job's kids all died. What is what is that about? And God ordained it. God killed all the four firstborn children of Egypt. I, I'm not even preparing this. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. God killed them. That was the last plague. Those the Egyptians were people and they had children, and those children died. So when she says, because the child is not meant to die early, he is meant to have a long life, okay, except when God chooses to end that life and he is all powerful and when god sends a she bear to attack a bunch of kids because they mocked his prophet and called him bald i don't know what you want to do with that were they meant to have a long life or were they meant to be eaten by a she bear because that's what happened the reason her explanation for the reason we're supposed to have a long life she says in the garden of eden and up until the time of the flood people lived long lives she says Psalms 90:10 says that we should live for for 70 to 10 or sorry that we should live from 70 to 80 years. Okay, well let's go look at Psalms chapter 10 again. Look at the parable. So or not parable. Look at the context. Psalms chapter 90 is a prayer of Moses, and he's kind of going through the anger of God and how God turns his back on them, and they're like. <laughs> they're consumed by his anger. Here's what verse 7 says. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set up iniquity before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All of our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Now here's verse 10. Our days may come to 70 years. May come to 70 years. Or 80, if our strength endures. Okay, may and if are not promises. That's may or if. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they will quickly pass and we will fly away. So the whole point of this parable is like, even though we're living this long, we're being judged by you because you're so angry at us because we're so sinful. Uh, then in verse 11, he says, if only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is too great. The fear is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. And then he goes on to say, Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. It cries out for kind of mercy. Okay, so that's Psalms 90.10 does not promise you that you're supposed to live to 70 or 80. Her next passage is Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. God says that a man's days should be 120 years. This means that everybody should be living until they are at least 70, but God has allotted each of us the amount of time this amount on time on earth. That's not true. And we also saw that after the flood, God limited the days. Again, God sent the flood. He killed lots of people, men, women, children at different ages. And what he killed everybody. So clearly not everybody was meant to have a long life. That's just not, that is so unbiblical. You have to, in order to come to the conclusion that there should be no suffering in the world anymore, and as Christians, that everything should go away. You have to close your eyes and just read a few passages, and that's it. You, there's so much human suffering mentioned throughout Scripture. There's so much death. And at the same time, God intervenes in the midst of it, and he shows us that there's more. But our hope is not in the now. It's in the kingdom to come. We know that things won't get perfect now. 
we see aspects of the kingdom coming and we see parts of the perfection. But again, like Paul said, now we see dimly in a mirror, but then face to face. It, there's a complete difference of what we will experience in the now compared to in perfection. She goes on. Let me just finish the chapter with a few more things that she said. But sometimes we don't even have to pray. Peter merely walked past people and every disease was healed and passed over the healed. I imagine that he wasn't even aware that people were feared by being a shadow until they were, uh, until they told him. Which is great. I mean, I'm all for the power of God. I believe in these miracles. I believe that uh, God used Peter, Peter in this way and that, that the apostles performed a lot of these um, crazy miracles. The thing that's interesting is you have people like Paul who also prefer miracles and then at the same time has his own thorn in his flesh that as he's praying, God's not answering him and God's saying, my power is made perfect in weakness and my grace is sufficient for you. And that was Paul's answer and he was okay with that after he had prayed a bunch of times. She goes on to say, I imagine that he wasn't aware. He carried the original power of like, oh, this is it. <laughs> so again, the kind of blasphemous statement here that she says, Peter carried the original power of let there be light, energy, power, light within him. And that's what we should be doing. Oh my gosh, that's, that's not true. The Holy Spirit is what empowered Peter. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives a portion's giftings. That's what scripture said. It never talks about that the light, at, when God spoke, the energy power light from quantum physics, from zero point field in you, but you need three other people, that's this power. That is not true. That is not what the scripture says. It's literally, I'm just reading chapter one, and I would say that that is, that's borderline heresy, to be honest. That's, <laughs> you can't. You can't discard the Holy Spirit this way. You can't minimize him or even at least if she was changing his role, maybe like saying that the Holy Spirit is this, but she's not even mentioning the Holy Spirit. She said that that Peter carried the original power of let there be light, energy, power, light within him, and that's what we should be doing. And she says, in this book, you will not only learn about the mysteries of sound, light, vibrations, frequencies, and energy, but you will also read the experiences of Bill Johnson Benny Johnson and Cal Pierce and others who were shaken by vibrations from God in such a way that they literally changed the way that they thought. All right. Chapter one. That. What I had heard concerned me, but what I just read concerns me even more. Maybe it will be redeemed. This is only chapter one. I haven't read chapter two. I haven't read the rest of the book. Maybe she'll explain it a little bit later. So I could be coming across very heavy-handed if, if there's more explanation in a later part. What I've just read makes no sense to me. And like I said, I, I would go as at least, at the very least, this is an error. This is an error in understanding scripture. It's an error in understanding who God is. It's an error in understanding the Holy Spirit. And at worst, it's blasphemy. I'm going to go with the error part. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I know, I keep saying I know, but I believe that their hearts are in the right place and they're well-intentioned people, uh, well-intentioned authors. They want to see the power of God. They want to see revival. They want to see people get saved and set free. They want to see the power in the kingdom of God. They want to, to fulfill that mandate of the kingdom of God coming to earth. And I think... She kind of got uh, almost fixated on this word sound a little bit too strong as a way that this could be the solution. Maybe we're just doing something wrong. And I've, I've seen this before, and I'm not saying that, that this is some kind of mystery cult, but sometimes the church starts like chasing these mysteries, the unknowns. We want to find the hiddenness of God because something's out there. There's, there's more power. There's more to be revealed. But the beautiful thing about Christianity, the thing that was so appealing to it in the first century, was that it was revealed. They had mystery religions in the first century church, um, not in the church, but in, in the world, cults, that the whole premise was in order to join this cult, you had to go through all these secret rituals and you would get gain this secret knowledge and information that only you had. And this 
secrecy will bring you salvation. And so sometimes you had to pay to get in. Sometimes you had to sacrifice the things to get in. You had to do certain rituals. And once you were in the club, you were in the club. You were in and you didn't reveal the secret. So a lot of the mystery cults, the practices, we don't know because they, they died and, and nobody shared about it. Most of what we know about mystery religions is from people that got saved out of mystery cults and shared their experiences in those cults, things that they did, practices that they had, beliefs that they had. And so we kind of got to peel into that. But one of the things that's amazing about Paul, and again, you read in Ephesians and, and Colossians, Paul reveals the mystery of the gospel. He says the mystery is that Gentiles are fellow heirs with, with Jews. <laughs> we can all get saved. So there is no quote unquote mystery of the gospel anymore. We God calls us friends. He says, Jesus tells his disciples, uh, you know, a servant doesn't know what his master's doing, but you know what I'm doing. You're my, you're my friends. You're my brothers. I'm, I'm including you in what's happening. God has laid out to us his plans. He's told us of his second coming. He's in the old Testament. He told them of a new covenant that will come. He's, he has let them know, and he hasn't kind of hidden them and you had to pay in order to get the, the secret knowledge. So anytime I kind of encounter people that are seeking this secret, hidden, mystery, thoughts, uh, it, it concerns me a little bit. So in this book, I'll not only learn about the mysteries of sound. See, that is a bit – that word just concerns me, the mystery. And you're going to reveal it to me because it's a mystery or this is an island that I can find. And again, I want to just emphasize – that at the beginning, the belief is that everything in this book is absolutely true. And I'm already one chapter in, and I, I can't see how that's the case. But let's continue on in chapter two and see if maybe I have my mind changed. I'm not sure. But thanks for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Love to chat about it.